I wrote a book three or four years ago um, called The Confidence Trap, which was driven by my sense that hasn't gone away that the biggest problem in contemporary democracies is knowing how much trouble we're in. Because in democracies, there are always people running around saying the sky's falling in. It's just part of democratic life. Newspapers in particular, but also commentators and politicians screaming fire. And the fire usually gets put out. And that's a line from Tocqueville. So Tocqueville had this line about democracies, more fires get started, more fires get put out. So you never really know which is the fire that might burn the whole thing down. And I had a feeling, so this was before, post the crisis, the financial crisis, but before the 2016 kind of political crisis. So when democracy was kind of bumbling along, we'd had the Euro crisis, but we kept seeming to get out of these scrapes we were getting in. How would we know when we'd kind of taken that step over the edge of the cliff? Um, and I drew on Tocqueville because he seemed, even though he was writing whenever it was, 1830s, 1840s, to have this prophetic sense of how democracy was going to play out over time, which was it would lurch from thinking everything was in chaos to a kind of complacency because each moment of chaos doesn't produce the final catastrophe. And that over time you'd get this kind of build-up of complacency each time the house doesn't fall down, people think oh, I can survive anything. So I thought that in 2012, 2013, that was our problem. Our problem was we don't know whether the house is about to fall down. And now in 2016, I still think we don't know whether the house is about to fall down, but it looks kind of shakier. And I think we've got an acute version of this question now, the sort of crying wolf problem, which is Brexit to a certain extent, but particularly Trump in the United States. When something like this happens, there is a tendency to think that we've taken that step too far. But I just think we don't know. I, th I don't think we even know how to know. That's, that's the problem. The problem for writing about it, the problem for thinking about it. We don't know what the markers are. We know what a democracy looks like when it collapses in Latin America or Africa or whatever. We don't know what it looks like when a stable, secure, prosperous, aging Western democracy goes wrong. I have a line in the book that says something like, democracies make mountains out of molehills, but they make molehills out of mountains. So they panic about the smallest things, but when this great big looming iceberg is there, they're quite good at breaking it up because what democratic politics does is it kind of fractures things, um, it disperses things, it allows all sorts of different points of view and opinions to get a bit of purchase on politics. And over time, it turns out, I think that's what makes democracy so successful is that they can take a great big looming crisis and they can kind of trivialize it. But the trouble is, <laughs> you can see what the problem is here, which is there may be some crises that if you trivialize them, you misrepresent them. So if you take Trump, um, I mean, I don't think people are trivializing him, but there is a kind of already a pervasive sense. Well, it's just part of the kind of back and forth of democratic life, Democrat in the White House for two terms, a Republican was probably going to win. Yeah, this one doesn't look like your average Republican, but already the establishment is kind of working out how to deal with him. That's what democracies do. They kind of take something that looks huge and hideous, and they make it look livable with. But almost by definition, at some point, democracies are going to make something that livable with that's not livable with. And then we're screwed. We haven't, we haven't reached that point yet. And actually, for 200 years, at the moments where it looked like that might happen. That's what my book is about. It never quite happened. It'll happen one day. Why are you so sure about that? Well, because in the end, <laughs> in the long run, as they say, always, I mean, so one day, yeah, uh, say there's another 200 years of democracy to come. I think we can be pretty sure that that business of taking big, looming, threatening, potential catastrophic things and trying to make them routine and everyday and manageable. One of those, one aspect of that will be misjudged and it will fail. I mean, I had thought when I read the book, I thought that the, the big problem was climate change because I thought climate change was exactly the kind of thing that if you make it manageable in democratic terms, you completely misrepresent the nature of the challenge. And so over 50 or 100 years, I had thought then that could be the one but it could equally be a, a constitutional failure. And democratic politics just ceases to function because a politician who does not, deep down, have any respect or belief in the democratic way of doing things is tolerated. I mean, that is a, 
that's a feasible way in which even mature, stable, prosperous democracies could fail. Um, and we, we may be there. I mean, we may be close to being there. I still think we're probably not. I still think that Trump versus normalization, normalization will win. It will kind of accommodate him. But I'm not sure. Tocqueville consciously was writing at the beginning of the story. So he thought democracy was the future and that he was at the early stages of a process which would have this kind of back and forth in it of panic followed by complacency, panic followed by complacency. And he saw it around him. He saw newspapers getting absurdly wound up about things he thought didn't matter, whereas the stuff that really mattered, slavery or whatever, you know, the real threat to the American Republic was somehow being pushed under the surface. But he thought it was early days in a long evolving history of the relationship between, I think he called it democratic ardency and democratic complacency, you know, being fired up and being too cool about it. But we're probably nearer the end, I would guess. I, I find it hard to believe that this story has another 200 years to run. And then the theme of my book is that the difference between how it looks to us and how it looks to him is we have that 150 years of added complacency built into our perspective. And that's where we struggle. And you, you see it around us now. There's a, this sort of trope that the 1930s is what we should be comparing the present situation to, which just doesn't work for me because it's implausible. It's not really like the 1930s. We don't face the same threats. That's a kind of crying wolf, seems to me, hysterical take on it. But also, kind of, we've learned the lesson of the 1930s. We, in a way, apart from anything else, if you'd leave out the hit of it, um, but the Great Depression and the ways in which the American economy was allowed to come right, right up to the edge of the precipice, the 2008 crash was consciously managed in order to avoid the 1930s. So we kind of know it's not the 1930s because we know that we didn't let it get that close to the cliff. But then in the 1930s, they didn't end up with Trump. And part of the reason we've got Trump is because we didn't let it get close to the cliff. And as I said in the piece I wrote in the LRB, I actually think that people voted for Trump partly because they feel reasonably confident that American democracy can survive Trump. I don't think people want Trump to bring the whole house down. I think they want the house to insulate them against Trump. And that's partly a function of the fact we kind of we have learned the lessons. We you know, democracies are these you know, they have this historical memory of how to step back from the edge of the cliff. And then what you get and I think Tocqueville would say this is absolutely what he would have expected is this build up of frustration. This kind of sense that democracy by never quite getting to the point of truth is storing up these problems and you get I think people like Trump are a symptom of a sense that along with the complacency the anger hasn't got anywhere to go and so it may be that actually what you get is something not worse than the 1930s but radically different Trump is not Roosevelt he's not Hitler definitely not Hitler but he's not Roosevelt either he's not anything from the uh, 1930s uh, I'm looking at a map and it's um, Virginia Whoa. Okay. If he wins Virginia, he's going to win. He's going to be president, I think. Maybe. Wow. Wow. So I have heard people say that Trump's election is to American political science what the crash of 2008 was to economic science, which I think is overstating it a bit. But there's definitely, I've seen political scientists it sort of in a daze, <laughs> wondering if they know anything anymore. There's a tendency of academics to either think they know everything or because of the sort of inherent arrogance of academics when it turns out they genuinely are wrong about something to therefore conclude they know nothing. Um, whereas, you know, the, the, I mean, Trump's election, it's not outside the bounds of predictive models and it's not as if he won. After all, he lost the popular vote. It's not like so, so, something happened that just doesn't fit, but Trump himself doesn't fit and people are having to sort of work out what that means. But yeah, I think it is also true that as democracy evolves, the thing that I've noticed, so the, the change that I've noticed in how academics think about politics is um, there, was, there has been a tendency uh, for a while to think that the fundamental challenges that we face, like climate or technology or education or employment, these are policy challenges. And the, the important thing is to work out what policies might work. 
and then to think about ways of sort of communicating them and engaging with politicians. And I think there is now a sense, and I almost panic, that while we do that, politics just goes completely the other way. And it, may, it doesn't matter in a way what policy solutions you come up with if while you're coming up with those policy solutions, Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. Um, and so I think the thing that has changed is a sense that it's integrated and the bits of politics that academics want to kind of often want to bracket, the wild, unpredictable, chaotic, populist bits, you can't bracket them. And if you want to think about the other stuff, you have to think about that too. And then the other thing I think must inevitably change is that academics need to start thinking about that they're part of the problem as well as part of the solution because what's been revealed by Brexit and Trump is that a university education is now one of the big social and political divides and that people on one side of that divide do not understand the people on the other side of that divide and vice versa. And it's no good for people with a university education to come up with solutions in a world in which for half, maybe more than half the population, those solutions are not solutions, they're just manifestations of a vested interest. And I don't think academics had been thinking like that at all. And I still think a lot of them aren't thinking like that, but I think they should. Like it's, you sit in a university and think you can come up with political solutions in a world in which sitting in a university is, for many people, symptomatic of the problem. There is a sense, I think a lot of people have it, that 2016 put into perspective things that seemed like a big deal at the time. Sort of some of the hoo-ha around Ed Miliband for and against looks a bit, what, what, what was that all about relative to what was what's really at stake now? But I do think, and I've written it in the LRB and elsewhere, that you, you also have to remember that in big political events, this is not set in stone. And small things, small changes, go back and tweak the past, you don't get these outcomes. So I've felt for a long time, I mean, for a long time I've thought part of the problem with British politics is the first past the post system. I think it doesn't fit um, and it produces these weird strains and these kind of almost sort of accidental results. One of which is Brexit, in that I don't think you get to Brexit um, under a sort of proportional system because I think Brexit is exactly the kind of thing that a party of government that doesn't have anyone to rein it in does, and the kind of gamble that politicians take under first past the post politics. And similarly, I, I think you know we're going to get this weird natural experiment in 2017, where there's this sort of populist wave and anger roiling around the world, and it's produced Brexit and it's produced Trump and it might produce Le Pen, and then maybe it'll hit Germany. But so far, it's only hit either in first past the post systems or as a result of referendums and plebiscitary binary politics. And it's not at all obvious to me that it has the same outlet under other systems of government. And that therefore it is possible that things that look a bit trivial relative to the size of what's happened aren't trivial because they're part of the cause of it. And I think there's a danger that we're losing sight of that. I do feel there's a sort of Brexit Trump kind of ah, the politics has suddenly got big again and it really matters and the things that we used to worry about don't matter. But actually the things that we used to worry about might have prevented it, this from happening. So I do feel that. I do feel that uh, had the Tories won just a few fewer seats in 2015, we probably wouldn't have left the European Union. Or, as I think I wrote in one piece in the LRB, well, it's hard to see how it would have happened because it was such a cat-handed referendum, but had the AV referendum passed in 2011, which most people think was a totally total non-event. But had we changed the voting system, I doubt would be where we are. So it's not the case that big political events mean that what went before them was trivial. Actually, what went before them might matter more than we realized at the time. I've written uh, uh, previously in the LRB a review of this book about 1979, um, which is another you know, crisis period in the history of Western democracy. And the thing that most struck me about that book, which tells the story of the people who, on that account, were going to shape the world over the next 30 years, Margaret Thatcher, Deng Xiaoping, Pope John Paul, Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, so in 1979, these people were just coming to power. In 1976, they were nowhere. You couldn't, you couldn't 
get odds from a bookmaker in 1976 that the future of the world will be shaped by the Bishop of Krakow, you know, the failed uh, Tory education minister, um, this exiled Iranian Ayatollah who seemed to be, and then Deng Xiaoping, who was also in exile somewhere in the Chinese. You know, the idea that these people were, now, those aren't all democratic stories, but certainly in the case of Margaret Thatcher, um, we, we don't know whether it's unlikely to be the politicians who are currently occupying our imagination. But you just never know. I mean, that's the thing. But while all of that drama is going on, Trump comes from nowhere. So again, 18 months ago, we know what the odds were, about 150 to 1 against Donald Trump winding up as president. Um, but while all our energy is you know, these amazing stories, these underlying problems just tick on. And one of them will get us. I mean, that's just certain, right? It is certain because nothing lasts forever. Democracy will not last. The system of government is not the end of history. It will not last forever. Something will get it. It could be Trump, but I think it's more likely in four years' time there'll be a Democrat in the White House. But over those four years, we'll have squandered an awful amount of energy and attention not thinking about the things that might get us.